You're listening to a sermon podcast from Redemption Hill Church, recorded at one of our worship services. Jacob will be preaching to us from 1 Samuel chapter 2 and 3. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 11. Then Elkanah went home to Ramah, and the boy was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli the priest. Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. The custom of the priests with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servant would come, while the meat was boiling, with a three-pronged fork in his hand, and he would thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. This is what they did at Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. Moreover, before the fat was burned, the priest's servant would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, Give meat for the priest to roast, for he will not accept bought meat from you, but only raw. And if the man said to him, Let them burn the fat first, and then take as much as you wish, he would say, No, you must give it now, and if not, I will take it by force. Thus the sin of the young man was very great in the sight of the Lord, For the men treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy clothed with a linen effort, and his mother used to make for him a little robe and take it to him each year when she went out with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. Then Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, May the Lord give you children by this woman for the petition she asked of the Lord. So then they would return to their home. Indeed, the Lord visited Hannah, and she conceived, and bore three sons and two daughters. And the boy Samuel grew in the presence of the Lord. Now Eli was very old, and he kept hearing all that his sons were doing to all Israel, and how they lay with the women who were serving at the entrance to the tent of meeting. And he said to them, Why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all these people. No, my sons, it is no good report that I hear the people of the Lord spreading abroad. If someone sins against a man, God will mediate for him. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? But they would not listen to the voice of their father, for it was the will of the Lord to put them to death. Now the boy Samuel continued to grow both in stature and in favor with the Lord and also with men. 1 Samuel chapter 3. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. The Lamb of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel and he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, lie down again. So he went and lay down. And the Lord called again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood, calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant hears. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel at which the two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. On that day, I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. And I declare to him that I am about to punish his house forever, 
for the iniquity that he knew, because his sons were blaspheming God, and he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay until morning, then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord, and Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son, and he said, Here I am. And Eli said, What was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you, and more also, if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. These are the true words of the living God. Thanks, Angelique. It's good for us to have uh, long scripture readings once in a while. Notice that uh, in the context of uh, Singapore, fast pace, constantly being a uh, Engage with uh, content, social medias. Um, it's hard for us, right, to sit down and listen to the scripture, especially if it's a long reading, and also prayer as well. I'm um, coming back to the sermon. We are now uh, in the series through the book of One Samuel. This is week number three. Uh, so that was a long scripture passage that was read. I, I pray a uh, longer prayer than usual. Um, I'm going to just dive right in to the text. Um, but before I dive right in, I'm also going to zoom out a little bit, just as how I zoom out in my prayer. I'm going to zoom out from 1 Samuel so that we can have a little bit of Bible overview before we um, get into where the text uh, landed today. First five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, and then how the law is given uh, in the wilderness, uh, followed by book number six in the Bible, the book of Joshua. So God Form a people, he called the people to himself in the book of Genesis. After the fall, he, he called Abraham by grace, made him a people. Uh, and um, you know, in, in the book of Exodus, he brought them out from Egypt and Joshua led them into the promised land. But the work is far from finished. They entered into the promised land, but they were not the promised people that God had intended for them to be. They were still a work in progress. So come the book of Judges, after book Joshua, and the book of Judges ended this way. In those days, there was no king in Israel. And what's the effect when there was no king? Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. So that was how the book of Judges ended. Some kind of cliffhanger. There was no king. So as the Bible transits from Joshua to 1 Samuel, the big question that is always looming behind is the need for a king. And not just any king, not just any king like the rest of the nations, but a king that truly represents God, his humility, the humble heart of who God is. But between Judges and 1 Samuel, there was this tiny little book called the Book of Ruth. It's a story of how a young woman, uh, means a, it means a man, a bachelor, end up marrying him. And, and you're wondering, like, you know, in the midst of all these big questions about the world, about salvation, redemption, how come there's like a rom-com in the middle of like uh, two uh, you know, books that talks about war and various things that were happening? Now, um, I want to highlight that the book of Ruth is actually really fascinating. I'm going to uh, just bring our attention to just a, a couple of verses in the book of Ruth which should be shown on the screen. Um, uh, this is how Ruth entered into God's kingdom. Uh, she had a mother-in-law called, called Naomi. She's a Moabite woman, Moab. By the way, uh, Moab is uh, one of the uh, significant enemies of uh, God's people uh, in, in, in the Old Testament. And here we have a Moabite woman proclaiming that your people shall be my people, your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. Her commitment to her mother-in-law. There, there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more also if anything but death parts me from you. Meaning I'm committed to you until death. Your God will be my God. Now, what is this pointing us to? It's pointing us to the truth that from quite early on, how a person become part of God's kingdom, they enter by faith. They enter by proclaiming that your God will be my God, from Ruth to Naomi, that I acknowledge that God is God and I belong to Him. And this is how the book of Ruth ended. Um, 
with, with, with a line about how Jesse fathered David. So um, Boaz, the man who married Ruth, uh, he, he, became the, he was the father of Obed, who was the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of David. And again, it's like ending on some kind of cliffhanger. Like, why would a book end on that note? And the answer is simple. Because going back to the big questions that is looming in the, the first few books of the Bible, we need a king. We long for a good king. And, and who would this king be? That's the question. And here, the book of Ruth ends with a sign of hope. Because David is remembered fondly as a king after God's heart. He's no perfect king, but he's a king, uh, in the large part, he, he ruled with righteousness. He's a shepherd, and one Samuel will focus on uh, who David is and his kingdom uh, in, in the later part through our series later on. Um, point, my point is this. We enter into God's kingdom by faith. So that's point number one. So no longer about what people group, right? So uh, you have Palestinian Christian brothers and sisters right now. While the bomb are flying past them, they are crying out to God, singing worship songs. It's going to mess up your mind a little bit. Well, Middle Eastern people, uh, we, don't, we don't normally associate them with the Christian faith, but there they are. They enter into the kingdom by faith. So that's point number one that I want to make in my introduction. My second sub point is this, that the kingdom of God does not come through power. The kind of power that we often associate with uh, in, in, in a worldly, earthly manner. It does not come through tanks and aircraft and nuclear weapons and bombs. It comes through very, very humble, lowly people. Last week we focused on Hannah. I begin the sermon by focusing on Ruth a little bit as an introduction. God's kingdom comes through very, very lowly, humble means and people. Which is good news, by the way. So you hear this again and again throughout this series. God raises the humble. He opposes the proud. God raises the humble. He opposes the proud. I'm going to repeat myself again and again throughout this sermon because that's the big idea. God raises the humble. He opposes the proud. And the title of my sermon today is uh, Passivity versus Humility. Um, often we don't think about passivity as a form of like, sin. It's, uh, maybe it's a character flaws. Maybe it's something that is not great. Um, but we don't normally think about it as like, some kind of sin that is grievous to God. Um, but we see how passivity is such an awful sin in this story. It's a silent sin with deadly consequences. It doesn't shout at you in a very obvious way, but we see that throughout this text. Now, a summary of uh, this, the, the book up to this point is uh, we have Elkanah, we have Hannah, little Samuel, and now Samuel is under the care of Eli serving the temple. And when the, when the writer Samuel um, recount what happened at the temple, the focus was on the two sons of Eli. They were supposed to be priests. Now, just, just a, a little bit of a... I don't know how obvious this is to you, um, but Samuel is the writer of this book, Samuel himself, okay? So this is him recounting things that he observed as a young boy. All these things were happening around him. Uh, how the two sons of uh, Eli uh, ministered, so-called ministered in the temples of God. And we see um, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12, uh, that the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. Wow, that's a very strong statement. <laughs> worthless men, right? <laughs> is very, very strong, almost black or white in a, in a very absolute way. They did not know the Lord. I don't think the Bible is even saying that they may not be Christian. The Bible is actually landing quite firmly that these are not God's people. So why are they serving in the temple in the first place? I don't we are told about uh, their name, uh, Hophni and uh, Phineas. I was trying to Google how do I pronounce their name. Then I realized that they were worthless. Maybe it's not worth my time to find out <laughs> how to pronounce their name correctly. Um, but joke aside, uh, this, is, this is what they did, right, in, in the temple. Um, as uh, Anjani read for us, uh, there was temple worship. People came to offer their sacrifice. Now, I'm not, no expert in uh, how all these Old Testament sacrifices they, they work, uh, but the text is telling us that this sacrifice, they were supposed to be to God. So how it worked uh, back then was a portion is given to God. The fats, the best part is given to God. And then there's a portion given to the priests um, because they, they, 
set their life uh, apart to serve God's people. Um, and, and so uh, there was a part that was given to them and then there was a part kept by those who brought the offerings. But we see in the text very clearly that there's some kind of robbery. The priests were taking the best part for themselves. And as if that is not bad enough, they resort to violence. Give me this item. If not, I will take it by force. That's in uh, verse uh, 16. Give it to me now. If not, I will take it by force. So there's some kind of bullying happening here, using of force and threats to get their way. A sense of entitlement, a sense of like, yeah, I, I'm, I'm here to call the shots. Now, just think about this for a while, right? This is so far away from the kind of humble, servant-like leadership that God calls his priest, his minister to be. Now, as if that is not bad enough, in verse 22, we, f- we find out that they were laying with women who were serving at the entrance of the tent of the meeting. That means these were women who were serving in the, in the context of the temple, uh, longing to draw near to God through their worship. And these spiritual leaders, they were using their position for sexual gratification. This is horrible. This is very, very bad. In modern language, we can call this spiritual abuse. Grooming. There's some kind of grooming activities going on there. Using your position of power to take advantage of those who trusted in the power that you were given. So this is an abuse of trust. Now, you may be wondering now, uh, Jacob, you call this passivity. I see them actively pursuing sins. Why, Why do you call this passivity? Now, you actually don't need much efforts to restrain yourself and behave like animals. That's my point. If you just passively follow your flesh, follow your desires without exercising restraint, all of us love money, sex, power, right? But we are image bearers of God. We are not animals. So these guys, they were just passively flowing along with their desires, acting and there was no God. And this is what it means by they were worthless. They did not know God. Uh, over the weekend, um, I was tuning in to the CCF conference, uh, which is happening right now. Um, CCF is a Christian Counseling Education Foundation in the US uh, that equip counselors. And this year, they focus on trauma. I was struck by how in the many, many case studies that they shared uh, during this year's conference, a lot was about abuse. I thought it's about, the talk is about trauma, but most of the examples that they gave was about abuses. And some of the examples that were shared, the case studies that were shared, were actually really disturbing to listen to because they happened in church. And what is so bad about abuse when it happens in churches? Uh, if you understand trauma, trauma is some kind of association. Your body remembers certain experiences that were deep and scarring, such that there's some kind of association. Uh, for example, if uh, there's a place where you had a traumatic experience and now you go to the same place again, very quickly, just by walking into the same area, you, your body begins to experience some emotion, some fight or flight or freeze responses because your body remembers, uh, or as uh, the writer of one book put it that way, the, the body keeps the score. And um, when abuse happens in the context of the Christian faith, in the context of the church, do you know who gets associated with the pain? God. God. So any spiritual leader that commit abuse to people in the name of God, God, in His Word, express a kind of anger at them that is intense and fierce. And that justified the language here in this verse. These are animals. These are worthless men who did not know the Lord. They committed atrocity against him. If you are a victim of spiritual manipulation and abuse by um, church leadership, I want you to know that God is angry about what happened to you. You may not even fully uh, know the extent of the damage done to you, but he cares for you. He knows. You may not even feel as angry as you should because sometimes experience like that can can, can even distort your sense of reality. It creates confusion. 
But the word of God express objectively God's anger, God's wrath against injustice and abuses. We'll talk about Eli. Remember Eli is still the guy in charge. He's the priest, he has two sons. Uh, I'm going to read for us a few verses from 1 Samuel 2, 20, verse 22 onward. Eli was very old. He kept hearing all that his sons were doing to all Israel, how they lay with women who were serving at the entrance to the tent of meeting, and he said to them, why do you do such things? Wow, great question to ask, right? I want to ask Eli, why do you ask why? Uh, and, and it seems like, you know, I hear of your evil dealing, no, my sons, this is not good. Uh, and then he start to reason, if someone sin against man, God will mediate for him, but if someone sin against Lord, who can intercede for him? He's trying to reason with them. Later on, in chapter 3, God pronounced a judgment upon Eli because he did not restrain his son. Now, when your children, when the priests that come after you were committing grave crimes against God and his people, this is no time to process with them like a good counselor. Sit down, why do you do this? Let me get to the heart. No, you stop them. It's as simple as you have to put a stop to this. You have to kick them out. You have to cut it off. There must be stronger intervention. What did Eli do? Nothing. His, his actions, his words, his rebuke amount to nothing. He was passive. He was cowardly. He was irresponsible. I think later on in the book of One Samuel, we, we also see um, hints that he also benefited from the abuses that his children were doing, his sons were doing, and maybe that could be a reason for him uh, not being as strong as he should. And God spoke to Samuel about Eli, that I will punish his house forever. For he knew that all these things were happening, that his son were blaspheming God, and he did not restrain them. And then in chapter 3, uh, Samuel received the word of the Lord from the Lord, and he told uh, Eli, um, chapter 3, verse 18, Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. This is Eli's response. It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. Now, which, which seems very pious, right? This is like... Uh, a man who says, well, God is in charge because he decides, because he has already ordained this, let him do whatever that he's pleased. Now, please do not be fooled by the pious language. This is a man who is passive. If your understanding of God's sovereignty produces an outwork in your life, there is something like this. Whatever will be, will be. Just let God do his work. I don't need to do anything much. Then that is not understanding who God is rightly. That is just partial truth. And partial truth is, can, can be deceptive. It's not the full truth. The Bible calls us to active response. So repeatedly we see active response before God as something that is good, something that God is pleased with. Remember last week's sermon, Hannah? She was a mess. She came before God about a hopeless situation that, that there is nothing she could do about and she just simply brought her mess to God and cried out to him repeatedly again and again. And God is pleased with a faith that looks like that, not with Eli's faith. So this is not a good example for us. Passivity is knowledge without obedience. Eli knew he did not do what was right. He knew, but he was not full up with actions. His sons were able to serve in the temple and look like they are believers, servants of God, but they did not do what was right before God. So here's the scary thing, right? You can have all the right knowledge. You can go for all the Christian education class, attend sermons, and accumulate all the knowledge that you have. And when you fail to obey, when you refuse to obey, the Bible actually warns us by saying that this could be a mark that you may not be in Christ. If, good, uh, I mean, I'm using Jesus' words, right? Uh, how do you tell what kind of tree this is? Good tree produces good fruits. An apple tree produces apple. You don't claim to be an apple tree if you are producing durian or something else, right? So it's as simple as your actions. The book of James put it this way faith without work is dead. Or Martin Luther puts it we are saved by faith alone. I'm not distributing that. We are saved by faith alone, but faith, the faith that saved is never alone. True saving faith always results 
in the active pursuit of God, an active killing of sins before sins kill us, an active drawing near to God to worship Him and to trust in Him. So it's just an encouragement for us. REC, we have no lack of knowledge here. I want to encourage us to take whatever that we know, those knowledge that we've been given, steward them well by actively obeying who God is. So that's my first point. Uh, God raises the humble, He opposes the proud. Uh, and the, the amount of humility is to trust and obey, which is my second point, trust and obey. It's actually a simple point, um, trust and obey. Hannah always wanted a child, and then she arrived at a place where she recognized that it's not just that she needs God, but she wants God more than anything. She desires God more than anything else. And then the child came along. And from that moment, she knew that everything about her life is about God. Everything is in vain other than God himself. She came to that place of realization and she simply trusted God and obeyed him and worshiped. So when she made a promise, this child that you are giving me, I'm going to commit him to your service. I'm going to commit this child Samuel to you, God, to temple service for the rest of his life. Uh, as a child came along, Hannah's posture was worship. She simply trusted and obeyed. Chapter 1, they worship God, Hannah and Elkanah, as they offer up Samuel to serve God. There's, there's no argument here. They simply trust, they simply obey. Now, I don't fully understand the cultural context of, uh, you know, um, based on the text, uh, right after he was weaned from his mother, possibly around the age of three or four, according to um, commentaries, uh, Samuel was probably three or four, toddler age, when he entered into temple, the temple to, to serve God um, that way. So I don't fully understand the cultural context, but as a parent, I know that while Hannah obeyed, it must have been extremely painful. It must have been extremely difficult. It must be emotionally challenging for her. And there's this surprising, uh, surprisingly moving little verse here, which I want to highlight to us. Sometimes we gloss uh, past it quite quickly. Uh, it's, it's found in verse 18 to 19. Uh, so Samuel was ministering before the Lord, uh, and his mother used to make for him a little rope. A little rope. Picture with me this tiny, cute little rope for a child and take it to him each year when she went up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. This suggests that they probably see him once a year. I, I don't know. Uh, we, we don't know the exact details, but it's not frequent. But every time she sees him in that annual visit, um, she'll bring along a rope and anticipating that he will outgrow it at some point and every year he receives a bigger size rope. And it just melts my heart to see the love of a parent to a child. It's not easy, uh, but this is how love looks like from a mother to a child. Now again, point is this, right? That, that who's the person writing all this? Samuel. So as Samuel recounted his childhood, little details like this were captured in the word, in the prophetic words that we have today. Now what it means for me, as I reflect on this verse, is his mother's love must be very significant to him. That even though his reality, his surrounding, I, I don't know how it's like to serve in the temple. I'm, I'm assuming it's not too exciting. Uh, and he's observing all these abuses happening around him. Uh, and yet we, we don't see him asking questions like, how can a good and faithful mother allow this life to happen to me? He had this object every year of his mother's love and he simply trusted in her love by faith. Now, friends, this is not too different from where we are today, right? Some of us long to have God's presence. God, can I have you as a real person so that I can touch and feel and see and know that you love me? And what I have is communion. <laughs> that's the only thing I can touch, right? Or baptism. Uh, and then the rest is just words and Bible and preaching. Now, God calls us to a faith that involves not just looking at the physical reality, but something that requires us to exercise eyes of faith, not just in the things that we see. And I think Samuel, even in this little verse, demonstrates for us. He's confident that he's dearly loved, he's raised 
by a lowly woman of humble estate and God raised him for a wonderful destiny ahead of him. And verse 26, the boy Samuel continued to grow in stature and in favor with the Lord and also with men. So the favor of God rested upon him against all odds. No signs of abandonment issues. Seems like a secure boy who grew up accomplishing wonderful things for the Lord. He grew up fine. Our parents, I, I, I do hear from parents uh, sometimes comments like, um, you know, I'm such a lousy mom or dad. Uh, I, I, I blew up again. I did not do what I should in modeling to my children what it looks like to be Christians. Um, yes, let's continue to be faithful in raising our children well, actively and not passively, modeling for them what a Christian life should look like. But ultimately, let's trust that it is God who is raising our children. Samuel is an example that in the world around him that is broken and completely messed up. Um, by, if you try to diagnose Samuel, you know, place in the temple at a young age in that kind of like mess up environment, um, the odds are against him. He should not be a, a grown up who is um, spiritually, emotionally healthy. But he was. He grew up fine. He was not permanently scarred. Um, I think for some of us, especially in the day and age where we often like to go for uh, counseling to uh, provide insights and understanding of how it's like for us to grow up in a certain family environment, uh, certain uh, things that happened to us when we were young, uh, how our parents treated us and therefore how certain things continue to impact us in our life. Um, I, do, I do find that to be super helpful and clarifying to those of us who have benefited um, from counselling. But when we look at family of origin, let's trace it all the way back to Adam and Eve, back to Abel and Cain, Abraham and Sarah, which is, by the way, an, uh, quite a dysfunctional marriage too. Uh, there were some odd incidents that happened that we see in the, in the scripture. Jacob and Esau, Joseph and his brothers. That's totally messed up, by the way. <laughs> and from there, look at all these families that we are now a part of because we are connected to them by faith right now and just acknowledge that we are all messed up in different ways. We are all messed up in different ways. And what is the ultimate reversal? What is the one trump card that we can look to that can change everything else? Jesus. I don't mean to make this into a Sunday school quick Q&A, but the answer really is Jesus. Friends, there are so many life in this ballroom that if I were to ask you, how come you are... You seem functional, you seem to have a healthy marriage, you seem to be raising your kids well, you seem to be serving in church as a functional adult, and you look at your family, and your answer to me is often, Jesus, God, by His grace, preserve me, raise me, help me, and use my life as an example of His redemptive glory. Your scars will be used by God and turn into glory. Friends, this is a really important message for the world, really. We live in a world that feels very hopeless. Past 20 years, I look at all the dramas and movies that were created. So many of them were about the ends of the world. How the, the earth is now unlivable and we need to find the nearest planet to move to. Uh, or the world is going to be taken over by fallen institution, robots and AI, and it's going to be hopeless. And uh, then there will be some survivors and the f movies will focus on them and things like that. It feels like increasingly there's a sense of hopelessness among our youth. Mental health issues... Now, I just really want to encourage us that we have a gospel of hope. We have a gospel that God is able to raise good, healthy, godly people in the midst of the broken world. Chapter 3, verse 1. The boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. So, what he's saying is that there were priests that did not behave like priests at all. And now God's presence is found in the most unlikely place. In a place where Eli, the supposed priest, is no longer sick. We see in the text that his eyesight is so dim that even though he is right there with Samuel at the ark, only one person is receiving the word. Isn't that amazing? And said at the same time that the Lord chose to speak to this lowly, humble little chap called Samuel. No credential, no, um, nothing to boast about in his accomplishment in the Lord. Just an ordinary, humble boy. And the Lord spoke to him. And in this account in uh, 1 Samuel 3, 
Three times the Lord cried out to him, and he thought that he was hearing things. Went to Eli, hey, did you call me? Oh, three times. After the third time, Eli himself is convinced that this is the Lord speaking to this boy, even though he could not hear. And he highlighted to Samuel, the next time you hear the voice, say, say this is what you should say to the Lord. And uh, so Eli um, said this to, to Samuel, and then Samuel complied, and he, he actually addressed himself as a servant before God, ready to respond. Not just wanting to hear more, receive more revelation, but the word servant, when Samuel responds to the Lord, I'm a servant, here I am as your servant, it implies that I'm not just here to receive your word, but I want to act upon your word. Humility is taking God's words as it is. I'm going to talk about it later on. But here we see that Samuel simply respond and trust. Faithful listening always result in obeying. And what's the outcome? The outcome is this boy grew. Verse 19, Samuel grew, the Lord was with him, and none of his words fall to the ground. And all of Israel, everywhere, they knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. And not, not just about, like, the, the glory doesn't go to Samuel. Through Samuel, God is glorified, and the rest of Israel is blessed. Shiloh was, is, is, is blessed. His word spread. Uh, there is a blessing that comes through our humble serving and obeying of God. Now, Samuel is such a wonderful character. I, I think that this is why it's such a popular name, Samuel. <laughs> there are so many Samuels in this church. Um, but it's, it's a marvelous, beautiful name. It's, um, it's a story of a boy, humble, small, meek, simply trusted in God's word. Now, humility means taking God at his words. It means simply trusting in him, simple obedience. Last night, I was like, trying to figure out, you know, when I come to this, this part, what kind of like, wise and insightful analogy or story can I tell you uh, to convince you of this point? And as I was like, doing that, uh, I, think, I think we have enough of like, good analogy. Uh, we just need to obey, really, guys. Um, we, we, we need to look at areas in our life where we are falling short and, and maybe at times stop using language that like, I've fallen to temptation, I've fallen into sin, and just call it as what it is. I disobey. I disobey. Uh, let's, let's not try to go easy on ourselves by saying, oh, the temptations are too huge. There are all these needs and longings that I have, therefore I fall into temptations and sins. No, I disobey. I, I know God. I know who He is. I know His commandment. I choose not to obey and follow them. For some of us who are making decisions and we're discerning, God, will you tell me whether I should go into this job, this country, or this relationship? Um, God, will you reveal to me your revelation? And the answer is He has already revealed to you through His Word. The question is, are you prepared to take his word as it is and respond with simple obedience even if you don't fully comprehend or understand. That is how humility looks like. Now, what does all this point us to? Because I'm mindful that for a sermon like this, I'm talking about active obedience, I'm talking about trusting God, I'm talking about working out our faith. Uh, if you are new Christians here or non-Christians here, you may assume that the Christian faith is all about trying harder. It's all about working hard. It's all about fighting sins and doing good and this and that. Now, all this points us to a place. A place where the Christian faith is all about. It's not about simply trying harder, but why are we humbling ourselves before God? And the answer is this, because God has revealed himself to us as good. He loves us. He loves us. Samuel had that little robe that reminds him of his mother's love, you and I, if there's one thing that we can touch and feel and eat, something physical, that would be communion. And what does communion point us to? The love of Jesus. The love of Jesus. Now in 1 Samuel 2, if someone sins against a man, God will mediate for him. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? This is like a situation that is serious, right? If, if you offend your friend, uh, you can do something right to make up for the offense to a fellow person. But if you committed a sin against God, which all of us, by the way, as human fallen uh, men and women after the fall, 
we all our sins are rooted back to the fall, where our love for money, for power, they are all traced back. They can all be traced back to our sinful desires. Our hearts are far away from God. So who can help us? Look at what God did to these disobedient children, the, the, the sons of Eli. It was the will of the Lord to put them to death. It was the will of the Lord to put them to death. The justice of God is revealed as judgment happens to those who deserve judgment. Apart from a just and righteous judgment, God cannot be good. God cannot be good. So God put them to death. It was the will of the Lord to put them to death. Now I find that phrase very interesting because in Isaiah 53, that was the exact same phrase that was used on a different person. It was the will of the Lord to crush him. Isaiah 53 verse 10. He was put, he has put him to grief and when his soul make an offering for guilt, he shall see his offsprings. He shall produce children, spiritual children. Consider the cross and compare the worthless sons of Eli versus the precious son of God, the one who is worth everything, the one who is ascribed the highest worth. He went to the cross for you and I so that God's love can be put on display to all of us. God gave his only son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that you and I, as sinful fallen human beings, can live through him. Jesus is a true and better Samuel. Jesus is the one that we look to. Jesus is not passive. Unlike passive Eli who simply cruised and flew along, Jesus set his face like flint towards Jerusalem and went up to the cross where he knew he would be offered up as an offering for guilt. In Jesus, we see true humility. We see faith in the Father. We see obedience. We see everything that we are not. <laughs> Let's acknowledge that. We see everything that we are not able to accomplish by our own strength because we are too weak, too messed up, too sinful to follow him. But because of Jesus, now we can. Because he has done that for us, he has given to us his spirit. And that is the good news. So if you are new here, if you are not a Christian, I want you to know that we are here to proclaim to you the good news that Jesus accomplished salvation for you. So that out of gladness and worship in your heart, you can follow and trust God and obey Him. Not out of guilt, not out of a sense of, I'm not good enough, but He has done that, accomplished that for you. The book of Samuel is meant to point us to Jesus ultimately. Just one closing uh, reflection and encouragement. Um, I just started a new book uh, by a man called uh, Andrew Wilson, a British pastor. Um, he wrote this book called God of All Things. I started reading the first chapter yesterday. Um, God of All Things is, is a book about like, the various aspects of creation. Uh, and the first chapter is about dust. How can we look at dust and how dust points to how awesome God is? Uh, he made some very, very insightful uh, reflection uh, which really blows my mind and moves my heart about how when I observe dust floating around in the air, it points me to the glory of God. But there was a line that struck me. Knowing that we come from the ground, in Genesis 1, we were told that uh, Adam was created out of dust. Knowing that we come from the ground keeps us grounded. We are nothing. We were created by God out of dust. And we will return to be like dust. We are nothing. And we have to be kept grounded that way. I just ended, uh, last week I was at... Um, Watermark Church in, uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, there was like very, very, very kind and hospitable treatment. I was treated like a VIP because they invited me to um, preach at their church retreat um, for, for the weekend, Saturday and Sunday. Um, it's like everyone was like, they, they catered a bus to go to the retreat center and back, um, but they catered an Uber for me and my family. <laughs> I didn't reject that. We just took out the offer. We have young kids. Um, I, I, I felt really, really honored by the church. And you know, as, as, I, as I received the honor, I also experienced a temptation to become proud. You know, it's, it's like, wow, people are showing me honor. I must be something. But remembering that I'm just the guy who is here to tell people about Jesus. Because Jesus is the real deal, not me. Jesus can raise anyone to proclaim his word. I'm just a guy wanting to love God's people well to proclaim the good news and it's not about me. That is so liberating. 
I don't need to go there feeling that I need to impress, right? Like they fly you all the way to Hong Kong to do a retreat and you, there's some pressure that I m- to make sure that the money is worth, <laughs> uh, the worth out. And, and no, I, I'm just there to proclaim that I'm weak, but Christ is strong. And I just experience how God works through the retreat, through someone who is uh, broken and weak. The point of this sermon is really very simple. God raises the humble, he opposes the proud. Again and again, we see in the scripture, we see in 1 Samuel, that God really raises and honor the humble, and he opposes the proud. And church, as REC um, continue to abide in God, he will continue to use us to be a fruitful church, to be a church that will do his work, accomplish great things in him, but let's never let that get into us and cause us to assume that it is because of us, therefore things are happening. No, it is always because of God's grace. Let's keep ourselves grounded on the ground, established firmly in the good news of God saving sinner. We are part of what he's doing. Let's keep ourselves grounded in humility and trust him to be the one using us as we keep acknowledging that we are weak, but Jesus is the one who is strong. I'm going to pray for us and Daryl is going to come up to lead us in the time of response. Okay? Let's pray together. Lord, we want to acknowledge again that you are good. You are great. You're accomplishing and doing great things in our midst. We are weak. We are fallen. But you are good. And because of what you have done for us in Christ Jesus, through Christ Jesus, the Spirit of God now rest in each one of us. And because of that, we can accomplish great things. We have a message of salvation and hope for the world that each one of us is called to stewards. And we pray, we pray that we will steward this message humbly through our life, through our words, through our actions. Help us never to grow proud. Help us to always be grounded in your word. Help us to always look to you, to humble ourselves, and to know that you alone are great. Help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name. You've been listening to a sermon podcast from Redemption Hill Church. You can find more of our sermons online at www.rhc.org.sg.